Hello and welcome to Dr. VGP Talk Show. Hello and welcome to Dr. VGP Talk Show that reaches 42 million households, including 2 million households across North America. Today, our guest is a legend in history, the superintendent of the Cook County Temporary Juvenile Detention Center on 1100 South Hamilton Street in Chicago. One often pass by this grandiose structure and wonder what's actually happening in the Juvenile Temporary Detention Center. In today's episode, you will learn from Superintendent Leonard Dixon who has 46 years in correctional administration about what the Juvenile Deten Temporary Detention Center, which has over 600 employees, 700 million staff, and has capacity for 395 residents, youth from 10 years to 18 years. It's the North America's largest Juvenile Temporary Detention Center. One of some of the historic people who have visited the Cook County Juvenile Line Temporary Detention Center and talked to the residents includes the late Congressman John Lewis. And we are very fortunate to have a deep insight into this facility, what's going on here, and how hundreds of lives of youth are being transformed. Every year, 3,500 youths pass through the Cook County Juvenile Line Temporary Detention Center, where lives are being transformed by the dedicated staff. Hello and welcome to Dr. VGP Talk Show that reaches 42 million households including 2 million households across North America. We are here today with our guest, the, a legend in history, someone you should know, Leonard Dixon, the superintendent of the America's largest juvenile temporary detention center right here in Cook County in the city of Chicago. We are so happy to have you, Superintendent Dixon, <laughs> join us today at the Dr. VGP Talk Show. No problem. Dr. Dixon, you have 46 years of history in the correctional administration, mm -hmm. and you broke the ceiling mm -hmm. to be the first black president of the National Juvenile Detention Association. Tell us about your early upbringing and childhood. Well, I was raised on a farm in Florida which, if you've been raised on a farm, it keeps you closer to nature. Um, my parents were, you know, from the World War II era, um, and they taught us about the value of working with people. Uh, my mother was also a midwife, so she delivered a lot of folks in the neighborhood. Uh, my dad and my uncle were like the first black sheriffs you know, in the area. And so I come from a family who um, believed in helping people and trying to help the community. Um, my, my brother was also the first black police chief 
in the city of Miami. And so I had a lot of foundational things to help me get to where I am now. Wonderful. Uh, so great to hear, Superintendent Dixon, that your brother was a police chief in Dade County in Miami. Yes. And uh, you were the first president of color for the National Juvenile Detention Center. Superintendent Dixon, it's been nine years that you have been the superintendent of the Juvenile Temporary Detention Center here mm -hmm. in Cook County, which has over 600 staff and a 70 million budget. That's correct. Could you tell us what the purpose of this Juvenile Temporary Detention Center? Well, the purpose of, of juvenile detention is, the, uh, uh, a good way of looking at it is, it's, it's the emergency room of the juvenile justice system. Um, because it's supposed to be a very short term, you know, placement for kids so that they're triaged so that when the courts make a decision, then the courts will determine, you know, what services that the kid needs once they uh, uh, have been adjudicated. Um, most folks have the idea that detention is supposed to be about rehabilitation and treatment. Well, the main focus of it should be the beginning of the rehab process. And what I mean by that is no different than you would go into the hospital. If you break your leg, you will go to the emergency room. Absolutely. They will triage it, take care of you, and then send you where you need to go. So we will do assessments, we will do evaluations, we look at kids' mental health needs, uh, we evaluate that, we will look at his educational needs, we will put things together. Um, one of the, the key components here is that from an educational standpoint, we have special, a lot of kids who have needs. We have over 19 special ed teachers wow. here in this facility, more than most schools would have. So it gives you an indication of the need that we have, and they're very good at working with kids. And so, um, and we also have kids that if they're here long enough, then they, they, they're able to graduate where they would not have been if they were in the community because they weren't going to school. And so it, it's always been amazing to me that kids did not receive certain uh, services in the community and did not get it until they got into the detention center. Um, not being able to see, getting them glasses. Uh, a lot of our kids has never been to a dentist. You know, uh, their uh, uh, food, uh, they're they, they food deserts in the community. And so they've not been able to uh, have proper diets and those kind of things. And you can see that happening so when they're here. So all these social determinants of health mm -hmm. have contributed to them being to do what they do. Now, usually in your temporary detention center, Superintendent Dixon, mm -hmm. you take residents from 10 years old up to 18. And what sort of crimes have they committed to come here from the court system? Well, we've had, what we've had now, uh, years ago when I first started, we had kids coming in uh, for missing school status offenders and those kind of things. Oh. Now we're getting kids who are, you know, they're uh, carjacking, you know, kids who have committed murder. Wow. Uh, some very serious, you know, crimes. And so that's what we're getting a lot of, you know, now, um, uh, which is a lot different than what we were getting, you know, years ago. Very interesting. And on a serious note, 10 years ago or nine years ago, you did you, you saw them for little petty things, crimes, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. But now it's more serious. Why do you think this has happened? Is it because of the informational age, the invasion of the, the knowledge and television and digital age? That why is this increase happening in this fragile segment of the population? Oh, I think there is um, there's some, there's been breakdown of the family. I think there is um, um, a lot of systemic racism that has planted itself and manifested itself. Um, um, there are um, services that even the families don't don't get that the kid needs to have. Um, I, I'm a firm believer that families are, uh, are extremely important on everything that you do. And when you have the breakdown of the family because of, you know, various reasons, 
then the kids are kind of on their own trying to do things. And one of the things I've learned in this business, there, there, were, there were three things when I talked to kids that they said would keep them out. And that's a safe place, someone to talk to, and the third one was um, uh, a job. So with those three things, you can reduce, because I, I, I'm, I, I'm a realist, um, a lot of times there are folks that, you know, create problems and you have to remove them. But it's not a lot of folks. I think if we do some of those things that I said earlier about working with the community, uh, getting rid of some of the food deserts, uh, making sure that the proper education not in the schools is happening uh, and connect those things, then you can always reduce that. Great. Superintendent Dixon, you just told us that three things to keep youth out of trouble. Mm -hmm. One is a safe place, mm -hmm. and then second one is someone to talk to, and mm -hmm. third is having a job security. Mm -hmm. Now, in today's world, youth racism, do you think there's racial and ethnic disparities where the, some of the residents, when you come in here, do you see a glaring disparity, and what's the reason for it? Oh, I think there's, 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 there's been a glaring disparity. Um, that's just part of what we have to work on in our country. We have one of the greatest countries in the world, but we still have a lot of things that we need to work on so that it includes, it has to be more inclusive. Um, that's why I always talk about Ubuntu, which is that African theology that says that I can't be you without you and you can't be me without me. And so it has to be connected so we understand that we're all in this together. And one of the things that we have not done is understood that it is a collective that we have to be, we have to work together to make sure that we help each other be successful. It can't be one group and doing one thing, another group doing another. It has to be everybody working in concert with each other. Yes, you very well said. You are known to be a hands-on superintendent. Mm -hmm. Could you tell our viewers how your day in your life at work goes? What time do you start? <laughs> Um, well, we're 24-7, so uh, my day usually starts about 6, 6.15 in the morning, um, and I'm usually here until about 3, sometimes 5, then on the weekends, it varies based on what's going on. Um, I spend a lot of time on the units. I'm not a, uh, um, a desk person, you know, uh, uh, I like to go up and meet with the kids. Uh, have conversations with them and hands on. That's very important. That's part very of trans important to me. Transforming young lives. Yes. Absolutely. Especially being a black male mm -hmm. because I believe that they, uh, the, if they can see successful folks, then they can gravitate towards that. Absolutely. You know, because some of the kids will say sometimes, well, you own the building. No, I don't own the building. <laughs> but in their minds, they see you as the top. And so they're interested in, in, and they feel good about that, you know, and that's what you want people to do. What are some of the challenges you come across in your everyday? You are, the center has a capacity for 395 residents. Mm -hmm. You all see about 200 residents. Mm -hmm. And overall, annually, you all see 3,500 youth passing through the doors of the Juvenile Temporary Detention Center. Mm -hmm. So there must be some challenges that you uh, come across. What is, could you narrate some of those? Well, things? the challenges a lot of times is trying to make sure that the structure stays in place that I put in place. And what I mean by that is um, I, I'm a firm believer that when you put people in good structures, then they can they can do well in that. And so making sure that from the time they get up until the time they go to bed, that there is somebody engaging them. Um, the, the, the difficulty you have now is trying to make sure that we have uh, sufficient staffing because like every other place in the country, you know, you have issues of not having enough staff. Um, the staff we do have are uh, outstanding. They, uh, uh, they, they, will, they will give their own time up a lot of times to be here to work with kids, which is uh, part of the, the culture that we built on Ubuntu. Let, let them know that everybody is connected and we want to help each other be successful. 
So um, um, one of the other challenges is, is, is for me is when I see uh, kids come in and they leave and you see them return. Um, that, that, that's hard yeah. because um, you, you, you're always trying to figure out what could you have done that's better. And Very true. there are people who really don't understand the kids that come in and don't understand our environment. And I, I've always said that what we need to be doing is having more things in the community for them. Um, I, I was working with one of the commissioners, uh, Commissioner Moore, and we were working on a project where um, kids who would get out, say they were still still a car. We have a place in the far south side that we were looking at that you could put money in, the kids could go there and they could help restore vehicles. Huh. So that's part of the restorative justice piece, but that is also a part of what Ubuntu is. And most people think restorative justice is something that happened here in, in the States. Well, restorative justice originated you in, know, Africa. in Africa and the Native Americans. Huh. That's who created restorative justice. And so the issue is understanding the essence of it and where it came from. And once you st understand that, then you understand how it's supposed to really work. And it's about building relationships and doing those kinds of things so people help each other be successful. Now, in the uh, residents which you have, do, mm -hmm. they, do you see uh, a certain number of them geographically skewed to one part of the Cook County? Yeah, we get a lot of kids from the, the south and the west side. Yeah. Um, um, uh, about 75, 80%, 80 of our kids are black. Okay. Um, th th that's one of the reasons why I was so interested, interested when I started in this field um, um, because I was playing the ball and I thought I was going to do a coach and then I got married and said, oh, you know what, the first job came and I got this and it actually, you know, uh, um, it, it, sometimes things happen and you don't know why they happen, but they happen for a good reason. Absolutely. And one of the things that I saw when I first came in the system was the overrepresentation of minorities in the system. And the question is, is why? And so looking at all of the systems, that's why I'm so passionate about making sure people understand the different aspects of the system. So you know what you're doing, because a lot of times people will say, well, we want to keep kids in detention. We want to do this. Well, juvenile detention was not designed it's for short periods of time. And if you don't understand it, then what happens is you are part of that perpetual piece of the racial stuff of keeping people locked up. And so you got to understand how those things, you know, work. And so that's why I see I say the temporary piece is so important because you're supposed to get the kid in and you're supposed to get them to where they need to go so they can receive the services they need to have. So this the resident who is in the juvenile temporary detention center does it go on his or her record like an arrest? Oh yeah. Or, or, or spending time incarcerated? Detention is a light it's not incarceration or is it incarceration? Well, anytime you take a person and um, you take them off the streets mm -hmm. and, and they're, they're confined. That's, okay. that's just, you know, what they are. Uh, their liberties are, are reduced. And so uh, that's just part of, of, of what happens. Um, what you're trying to do is, since we know that, and we know that the longer a kid stays in detention, you know, like, like any other person, the worse they get. Well, what you want to do is get them out so you can get them to where the help that they need. And that's why understanding the difference between a detention center and a treatment facility, the detention center and a halfway house, a detention center and a group, and a group home. home. Exactly. Understanding those different pieces, they are different for a reason. OK, uh, you may have secure detention and then you have secure residential. Well, Absolutely. those are two separate and distinct things. And you have to understand how they are placed. And once you understand that, then you understand the system, how it's supposed to work. That, you said it so well, uh, Superintendent Dixon. Could you tell us what's 
in a day for a resident? How do they start the day? What are the meals? Do mm -hmm. they have classes? You know, to, uh, how, how do they spend the time in detention? Well, they, st we, they start, um, the wake up is at six. Okay. Um, so they start waking up at six. Um, of course, they do their hygiene. Uh, they eat breakfast, actually eat pretty good. Okay. Uh, and they're in school for uh, a, a lot of the day. Oh, and then you have um, uh, different kinds of uh, programs that we have for them, uh, 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 group, uh, different kind of small groups, uh, different kinds of, uh, um, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, education rec education classes, programs, classes, right? recreation programs, vocational skills. Definitely. Vocational skills. Uh, we have like a uh, uh, barber program that we have here that one of the first ones, you know, in the state. Um, Great. We have an electrical program. We have a painter's program where kids right. have left here. And actually, once they've gone through the process with the facility management helping us, they uh, uh, got jobs. Uh, and that was just in a short period of time. That's uh -huh. why I keep saying that if they're here for, if, if you can do this stuff in the community, they would not be here. Correct. That's why I'm so, you know, uh, adamant, you know, about that. They, uh, um, uh, they have. Uh, um, do, do they have some recreation time? They have recreation time. Games? They have a lot of recreation that goes on because what folks don't realize, recreation is for kids, what work is for adults. Absolutely. That's how they learn how to get along. Correct. Okay. Um, we've had kids who uh, have graduated, gotten their um, um, uh, high school diplomas, you know, here, which is unheard of in detention centers. Uh, most people can't do that. Uh, we've been able to, to do that. And the reason is, is because if a kid is here long enough, say he has some adult charges, if we know he's close to graduating to get a, a um, high, school uh, high school diploma, then the judges allow us to hold them for a, short, a, 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 a little period. longer. And we know that 85% of the people who are in prison don't have a high school diploma. And so if we can get them at least that, then that will help them. You know, we can't control the, the, the criminal aspect of it, but we, what we can control is, giving hey, them an education. give them an education, and this is something that you can take and do some other stuff with. Hopefully um, it, it, it works, but that's what we know through the research is that about 80, 85% of people in jail don't have a high school diploma. And so everything you can do to uh, assist with that. So education is a centerpiece part of transforming lives. So there's no question about it. And uh, what would you say some of the success stories uh, for the residents and for the center as a whole? How have you contributed and how is Cook County making this one of the global center of excellence, being the largest mm -hmm. detention center in America? What are the strengths of this institution? I think one of the strengths of the institution is having um, a boss um, who has given me the, the, the flexibility to do what needs to be done. That's very um, an innovative Chief Judge workplace. Evans. Yes. Yeah. Chief Judge Tim Evans has been outstanding. He has helped us, you know, uh, with funding for different programs, uh, having evening programs weekend programs for kids, um, for, uh, for, for a person at that level to um, care about what we're doing and care about uh, the, the young people is, one, is an extraordinary thing because I've been around long enough to see where people just saw things as a checkbox and he doesn't see it as a checkbox. He, see he sees it as, hey, what we can do to help. Um, uh, book bag programs um, or every kid doing uh, before they leave here gets a book bag full of um, uh, pencils and notepads and calculators and this stuff so every kid that was leave here got that book bag oh that's great you'll also give them any computer training classes to how to use a computer oh they have computer it. classes here good um, uh, you ha and you have to be mindful of that because, you know, kids are very smart. They can go into computers and try to maneuver things sometimes. Right. And so you have to make sure that the security stuff is in check. 
Okay. But no, uh, the school is good at looking at the computer computers and working with kids. And the kids are so technolog technological savvy now that they come with with a lot of stuff now. Already. They, 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 you know, they, they have that just on their phones. You know, they can do all kinds of things. So. Are um, they allowed to keep their phones with them? Oh, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 we're very secure. Um, but back to your your other piece of no, they're they're when they're school, um, they have we have excellent cooks, and so you can actually see um, if a kid is here for a couple of weeks, you can actually see with them getting the proper rest, you can see their body start to change they because they have a proper diet now. Great. You know their their uh, nutritional status. The nutritional is status is improved. You can also uh, see kids who. Um, um, once they're, they they go to the dentist and the dentist is looking at them and take care of the teeth. And I give an example of what I mean. We had a kid at one point who would get into uh, want to get in fights all the time. Right. And once they fix his teeth, he's never got into another fight. Wow. Because that that self-awareness of, hey, uh, people making jokes about you and those kinds of things. Raising it's, the self-esteem. The self-esteem is, is, is risen. Mm -hmm. And those are the kind of things where I'm almost certain that if you would have had those things before in the community, you probably would not have been here. You know, and so it's those little things and those little nuanced things that people don't pay attention to. A kid can't see the blackboard because he needs glasses. You know, so all those kind of things are, are extremely important. You just heard Superintendent Dixon giving full credit to the Chief Judge Tim Evans of the Cook County Circuit Court, uh, who oversees the Juveline Temporary Detention Center, the largest in the country. And some of the innovative workplace he has transformed it is the evening program, getting extra funds for the evening program, the weekend program, the book back program. And this has made this detention center into an innovative workplace which transforms lives of our young people who are going through challenges in their life. And uh, Superintendent Dixon, on that note, what do you, where do you think the youth today are headed at? I think we have more successful kids than we have kids who are not successful. I think one of the problems that we've had in our country is that we always go to the negative a lot of times. Absolutely. And we don't talk about enough those kids who are graduating from, from, from school, uh, from high school. Uh, when I first came into the system, you, you didn't hear uh, staff, because we were one of the first generations that, that um, were able to get you know, pretty good jobs after our parents, which means that we had the ability to provide some additional resources so our kids could go to school. Well, what you're seeing now is the majority of staff in here are college educated, which wasn't happening in the past. Well, with that, that means that their kids have the ability to be college educated. Absolutely. And so now what you hear people talking, when you walk through our facility, we all, a, a, a lot of university uh, signatures on all of the doors and, and those kinds of things because staff, you know, um, they, they appreciate that. Well, you hear staff now talking about, oh, my son is graduating from this school. Oh, my daughter is graduating from this school. And so we tend not to show that enough from uh, in, our, in, our, in our society. We, we, we tend to focus everything on the negative. And I'm a firm believer that the more positive things you show, the better people are going to respond to it. And kids in particular, because what they see, they gravitate towards. You're absolutely right. So Superintendent Dixon is saying education is the key to success and the cornerstone to mm -hmm. transform lives. Mm -hmm. Basic education, high school diploma and going on to college is something which is very vital to change the system, mm -hmm. to resolve the mental health crisis going on today, mm -hmm. not only in America, across the world, to reduce violence, gun violence, mm -hmm. crime, mm -hmm. and plays an important role in juvenile criminal justice. Superintendent Dixon, you've enlightened us on the various aspects and working of America's largest Juvenile Temporary Detention Center. What is the critical impact of your center to society at large? I think one of the critical 
impacts is when we get kids and we're able to work with their medical needs, their some of the social needs, that transfers back into the community. It's like the kid I was talking about fixing his teeth. When you do that, that means that the kid goes back into the community and can become successful and move away from some of the things that they were doing. Um, what I've learned a long time ago is that uh, nothing's ever guaranteed in life. Absolutely. The issue is, is that, but did we make an effort to try to help folks be successful? Um, the, 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 the medical department here, which is outstanding, to, to be able to uh, identify kids with, with asthma and, and, and those kinds of things, to me is extremely important because that kid now understands why he's having some problems. Uh, so what this facility has done is actually placed a lot of kids back in the community who had not, the problems that they had had not been identified until they've gotten here. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I was getting on the, 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 the red line one day and on a Saturday and a kid, three kids were coming. And most of the time when you see some kids coming, you say, okay, well, what's, getting, what's going on? And the first thing they said, Mr. Dixon, Mr. Dixon. And I'm like, okay, well, what's happening? And I said, okay, what's going on, guys? They said, you remember us? I said, yeah. I said, oh, and then I said, yeah, okay. We just want to let you know that we're doing good. And so those are three kids who um, I felt very good of, hey, I've met with them, our staff meet with them, we work with them diligently for the short period of time we had them, but they wanted to acknowledge that the stuff that we put in place, the conversations that we had with them were so significant that they remembered it. And they wanted to make sure that I knew that they remembered it. And that's one of the, the, the things that make me feel good about what we do in our business. And those are things that you can't put on paper. You know, those those things that people don't get to see and you can't put a number on it and you can't do uh, statistics on it. That's Ubuntu. Those are the things that folks need to understand that the relationships that you build with folks is going to be tantamount to how they respond to things. I fully agree with you, Superintendent Dixon. The Juvenile Line Temporary Detention Center is actually a hidden crown jewel mm -hmm. in the Juvenile Line justice system mm -hmm. today. And its impact to society is transforming the youth who are committed mm -hmm. some offenses and trying to put them back on life and mm -hmm. getting them the youth reentry program. Mm -hmm. And just like you said on the red line that you had three youth and mm -hmm. called you Mr. Dixon, we are mm -hmm. doing fine. I mean, that's a testament in itself. Mm -hmm. And you all are doing phenomenal work in that direction because every time we pass by Roosevelt Road or Hamilton Avenue we see this big building the big <laughs> sign up Juvenile Line, temporarily Juvenile Line <laughs> Detention Center we're wondering what's going on here and uh, now we have got a great insight mm -hmm. and enlightened mm -hmm. all of us on this wonderful work you're doing here mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. work a lot more to be done mm -hmm. uh, Superintendent Dixon talked about the importance of having family having education and transforming the youth is a journey which has begun for him nine years ago but his continual work every one of you all have to be involved mm -hmm. into making this place a safer place a better place mm -hmm. for all of us to live mm -hmm. on before we go to your personal section mm -hmm. where i wanted to ask you will artificial intelligence affect the way youth would it reduce mental health crisis would it reduce crime would it shape the youth differently I don't think we know that yet. Uh, one, one of the concerns I have is that we, we can't allow technology to take the place of people. And I think one of the things that uh, um, it, it's, it's like um, we have people who are these uh, keyboard um, antagonists mm -hmm. where they won't say something to someone in their face but they'll get behind a keyboard and do it. And my issue is, is that 
we have to, as a human being, you have to be able to engage people. You have to be able to, if I have a disagreement with you, you we can work it out. When you, when you hide behind technology, it doesn't allow that to occur. And I think that's one of the downfalls of technology sometimes. It's a great thing and you can use it to help a lot of good things that's happening. There's always a good and bad in, in things. But I think that uh, from, from, from a kid's standpoint, I'm a firm believer that we need to allow kids to be kids. And to creatively think and creatively, you, Yes. My grandkids, um, when they come to the house, I allow, I allow them to play games, but they have to tell me about what's going on with them. With them. I want to know about what's happening in school. I don't need you to email me that. I need for you to talk to me and have a relationship so that we can talk about some things because life is very difficult in, in good times. And so you need to have somebody to work you through those things. And you can't do that if you're not uh, engaging people. Absolutely. And, and taking the, the, you know, we have a problem sometimes of not listening to people who are seniors. And I'm a firm believer that you always listen to those folks because they have a lot of things that you missed. You think you know what you know, right. but they've already experienced it. And right. so you want to co collect information and collect things from them to make things I think conversation on. is a very important piece mm -hmm. of communication, especially with the mm -hmm. younger generation. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite TV shows, Empire, I think an episode was mm -hmm. filmed here. Mm -hmm. How did it go and how did it come about? Uh, I, I thought it was good. I, it gave the staff an opportunity to see how a, uh, a, a show sitcom. was, a, a sitcom was, was made. Uh, the kids got an opportunity to meet, you know, some of the actors that you would never get to see these folks in life. Right. Um, our barber program, you know, actually was, was a spinoff because what folks didn't realize that the, the barbers and beauticians and all that get paid a lot of money, mm -hmm. you know, to work with these folks. And so to get to see those kinds of things in real time and to see folks that you would never meet in your life was an experience for the staff and the kids. I think that was a very innovative way of introducing a new dimension mm -hmm. to the residents of the detention mm -hmm. center. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Subhanan Dixon, if you're given an opportunity to take three people out for dinner from the past to the present, who would those three people be and why? Uh, like your heroes or? Well, you know, Luther Vandross has a good song um, about uh, uh, his father dancing with my father. I wish I could go back and spend some time with my father and my grandfather. Um, I wish if I had to, because I, I sat down with them when I was younger and they, they, they just gave so much knowledge, you know. Um, another person would be um, John Adams, um, the, the one of the presidents of the United States, which I don't think he gets enough, you know, credit. Most people don't realize that John Adams was the only founding father that never owned slaves. Wow. Most people don't realize that. Um, so to have a conversation, he was an irascible guy, but he was highly intelligent and he wanted to do things right. The constitution that they have in, 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 in Massachusetts is the same constitution that he developed, you know, back in, in the day. Yeah, yeah. And so he was able to talk about education, the arts, and all those kind of things in that constitution. Um, the, the third person would be um, probably, um, mm, well, I've met a lot of people. Jim Brown, Muhammad Ali, I've got a chance to meet and have a conversation with those guys. Um, a person, third person, would probably be Nelson Mandela. That's not good. Um, because a person who had went through all the stuff that he's went through and was still had the humanistic and the human connection and value to say that we're still going to try to work with you even though you've done all these things to me, to me was remarkable. To not to have that kind of um, animus towards people 
after going through what you went through, you know, to have to sit down and have a conversation, you know, with him. Viewers, Superintendent Dixon's three people he would like to have dinner with. First, his father and grandfather, who he misses today, to have a good conversation. Second is President John Adams, and he very well said why he would like to have dinner with President John Adams. He was one of the earliest presidents who didn't have any slaves working for him. Mm -hmm. And his insightfulness in including education and arts as parameters of life's building blocks. And the third person, of course, is South Africa's Nelson Mandela. And uh, he fought the apartheid movement in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And these are his three heroes uh, for Superintendent Dixon. Gives us a little insight into your personality mm -hmm. when we ask you that, uh, Superintendent Dixon. Mm -hmm. In three words, how will you describe yourself? Three adjectives. Yeah. Um, committed. Good. Uh, strong. Um, compassionate. Great. Superintendent Dixon, Leonard Dixon, a legend in history, describes himself as committed, strong, and passionate. Three beautiful adjectives to describe a person who's trying, working hard every day from 6.45 a.m., uh, sometimes early at 6.15, Monday through Friday, and including weekends to transform the lives of young people, putting them back on the street, giving them an opportunity to live a full life. He and his staff, 600 staff at the Juveline Temporary Detention Center working round the clock to trying to make the, make these wonderful youth who have come here and try to reform them to make them great citizens of a great country. Sir, we salute you for your wonderful work and your staff you're doing and uh, we hope that you will be able to reach your goals positively. In closing, we'd like you to give a word of advice or a passing message to all our viewers worldwide, whatever you feel like telling our viewers today. Well, we're all part of the human family and being part of the human family mean that we're all connected. And if we start viewing ourselves as that human family, I think a lot of things will be brought to bear to help us be more successful in the world and in this country. Thank you so much, Superintendent Dixon, for joining us. You're welcome. And um, we really enjoyed you having you on our show. Okay. And we hope to come back and get some updates. Keep up the great work you're thank doing. Thank you, my brother. And we'd like to thank your uh, employer, your chief judge, Tim Evans, okay. for the, making this Juvenile Temporary Detention Center an innovative workplace for right. progress and prosperity for our youth. Right. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. All thank right. you.